Hello everyone, thank you so much for listening to this presentation. It's recorded for the British Association for Irish Studies online conference in May 2020. And I really like to thank the BAIS for organising this event. It's been really interesting. I've really enjoyed the presentation so far. It's been a great learning experience as well. So for this presentation, I am using one case study from my research. So I'm using the town of Nina, where I'm currently spending lockdown. And I'm using it to explore public expression of identity through public history in the form of monuments and consider who these publics were and how or whether these monuments represent the evolution of a collective identity. So, My research focuses on the question of how public history was used to shape and reflect evolving identities in the two Irish states after partition, an event which I argue changed how societies viewed their communal identity and it caused a massive societal upheaval in the form of violence and migration. I'm using the areas of Dublin, Belfast, Nina and Limavadi as micro studies to investigate this question in both urban and rural contexts. Anyone unfamiliar with public history, there's a really brief uh, description on the screen. The pillar that I work with in my research is pillar three. I'm quickly going to give a very brief bit of context. Um, I'm sure most of you are all familiar with this, but just to set the scene, the Government of Ireland Act of 1920 partitioned the island of Ireland into two states. There was Northern Ireland and the Irish Free State, which is now the Irish Republic. The partition was the result of a long-standing, bitter and often violent conflict between the followers of two schools of political thought in Ireland, the Nationalists and the Unionists. Nationalists fought for their right to a certain independent 32 county republic, but the majority chose to accept the terms of the British Prime Minister Lloyd George, which granted them a 26 county a parliament for 26 counties based in Dublin, but ultimately overseen by London. The treaty was narrowly ratified. It was 64 votes to 58 in Dáil Éireann, the Irish Parliament. This led to a civil war in Ireland between the pro-treaty I come in the veil of free staters and the anti treatyite Sinn Féin IRA or Irregulars. So it's on the eve of this civil war and in its eventual aftermath that we come to Nina and the expressions of identity happening in that public sphere. Monuments and statues are erected by communities as a method of expressing cultural identity. It's evidence that the life of a monument is not static and monuments that are popular and celebrated in one generation may find themselves torn down, vandalized, or just disregarded in the next. They are public expressions of cultural identity, which is fluid and they can undergo huge change in a really short amount of time. Friedrich Nietzsche described monumental history as inspirational to the living because it persuades people that the greatness of the past is possible again by presenting the past as a succession of great individuals linked across the millennia by their ideas or aims. Irish nationalist organisations invested a great deal in the erection of monuments and the creation of heroes in the late 19th century during the Irish revival. The state followed suit in the early years of its existence, albeit as Aunt Dolan has proved, only when those dead were considered a commodity. This practice was mirrored by non-governmental organisations to include their heroes and their narrative in the public sphere and to ensure the continuation of their ideals and histories. So. So in Nina County Tipperary, located in the Midlands region, you can see it there on the map with a red dot, there were three monuments erected within the town boundaries during this period, which is 1921 to 39, so the interwar years. Archival research and oral history interviews have not revealed any monuments that may have been planned and not executed, or were erected and subsequently destroyed or removed. In my other areas where, my other case study areas, um, that is the case, but in Nina it's not. Um, the three monuments are all situated in the town centre. Um, so you, again, you can see it marked here on the map. Um, they're all located within 500 metres of each other. Two of the monuments are on Ash Road, and the third is where Ash Road meets the central thoroughfare of Bamba Square. The three monuments are the Dennis Carey Memorial, which was erected in 1922, Nina War Memorial in 1928, and the North Tipperary Republican Monument in 1931. So monuments in the urban centre of Nina began to be planned, funded and erected very early in this period of study. So in one case, a memorial to Dennis Carey, a young IRA volunteer killed in a black and tan reprisal attack in November 1920, was erected in June 1922, just as civil war was threatening the new state. The memorial you can see here is made of Irish limestone and it was carved by a local stonemason named James Murray. It's inscribed in the old Irish script and Irish only. And it reads, in the equivalent of Gunnica Ikira, I do regular galliv on shay laws for him in a hound, may beg as a fiha, her son, the heron, beg shay. 
That phrase, a doom bargain, a murdered by foreigners, the choice of words for this memorial is actually not uncommon in nationalist memorials to the dead. The wording is surrounded by decorative Celtic crosses and knots and a plain cruise form in the centre of the bordering with harps and shamrocks situated atop. It forms part of the adjoining wall and is placed on the spot that Kerry was believed to have been shot on the 24th of November 1920. The unveiling ceremony was led by a local priest, Father Pat O'Halloran, who urged people in remembrance of the tragic death of a young man to come together and forget their differences. And in an apparent reference to the gang rape of Miss Harriet Bakes, the Protestant wife of a member of a well-known landed military family, which had been committed in the locality only nine days previous, he decried those who now, and I quote, take revenge on the beaten foe, a thing which no manly man would do. Father O'Halloran's admonishments were seemingly in vain, as that summer there were multiple attacks in North Tipperary on the local Protestant population, a number of them involving sexual harassment of women. In a letter written a week before the attack on Mrs. Harriet Biggs, the Church of Ireland Bishop of Killaloo and Clonfert, so of the locality, Bishop Sterling Berry, wrote about North Tipperary specifically, declaring that a state of terrorism exists for the Protestant community there. Father Halloran's speech heroicizes the young martyr Dennis Carey, declaring that the spot in which the plaque is placed is, sac is a sacred holy place for, and I quote, it has drunk the blood of one who died for Ireland. And so highlighting the connection between the place that blood was spilled and the holiness and sacredness of that act, Father Halloran is associating the young Dennis Carey with images of Christ and his sacrifice. His speech identifies the position of the local representative of the Catholic Church as exclusively Irish, which is being defined at this time to mean Gaelic and anti-British. This has the effect of ensuring that the identity of Irish as Catholic and Catholic as Irish is to the forefront in the local public consciousness. This monument, which was unveiled only two years after Dennis's death, reflects a community united in their mourning of their fallen family, friends and comrades, and one, and in, and one entreating an end to further conflict and violence. The Dennis Carey Memorial lacks the political and emotional weight of the Irish Civil War, the, and again I quote, most painful part of our Irish history, as Father Pat O'Halloran later described it. So now we have the War Memorial Cross. This is Nina's tribute to the dead of the First World War and it was erected in November 1928 outside the ex-servicemen's hut, so the British Legion hut, further up Ash Road in Nina Town. It, with approximately 600 people present, it was a small affair and the local newspaper attributed the bad weather to the poor turnout. Mr. Edward Heaney, on behalf of the committee, originally requested space in Bamba Square for the memorial to the dead of the First World War, but the site was refused by the Urban District Council in May 1928 after consideration on the grounds that it would be an insult, and here I quote again, to their own dead. In a sweeping statement, rejecting the young men from the town who were killed in the trenches. The Irish Independent that year estimated that approximately 130 men from the locality had died in the war. There was a fear that the memorial would become a rallying point for the forces of imperialism still present in the town on Empire Day or Armistice Day, and to allow the erection of such a monument might leave the actions and sentiments of the council, and by extension then the wider community, open to misinterpretation. The memorial to Dennis Carey, previously mentioned, was actually also cited as a reason to object to the monument being erected on the private grounds, even where it currently stands, on the basis that the proximity of the monuments might allow the strains of the English National Anthem to travel from one monument from the War Memorial Cross to the other, the Dennis Carey Memorial, confirming that the council expected that any ceremony involving the cross would by its nature be imperial. The Urban District Council further refused to grant the moral support to the erection of the memorial that the organising committee had requested, asserting that it was not the business of the council to grant such. While they acknowledged the sincerity of those who wished to honour their fallen comrades, there were members of the council who were suspicious as to the true motivations behind an application for public space in the town centre. Reports of the meeting suggested discomfort amongst the council, not to the idea of remembrance, but to the style in which it would be carried out. And now I'm just going to share a different screen with you. Um, So this is um, this video of an unveiling of a World War I cross in Longford. Press play there. So this is the unveiling of a World War I cross, Memorial Cross in Longford, and the imperialist symbolism and pro-British assertion is prevalent. Uh, it may have been too much for the, the Urban District Council of Mina. Note the Union Jack flags and, and the banners here. It was recorded in 1925 in the Irish Free State, and it gives us an indication as to what kind of ceremonies uh, were expected to surround 
monuments to the dead of, of the First World War. So the memorial to the fallen of the First World War was relegated to the privately owned land of the ex-servicemen's hut. Where the cross is erected, although it's, n although it's on private property, it's visible and accessible to the passing public, which is evident here in the picture. So yeah, so that picture is just taken from the footpath. It's, it's accessible and visible to the passing public. So it's not entirely private. It's not fully embraced in the public space. It and the men of the area that it commemorates remain in a sort of no man's land. And the final monument erected in this period of study was on the 23rd of August, 1931, on the spot that Edward Heaney had requested permission to build a memorial to the Great War. The North to Grey Republican monument was unveiled in Nina to crowds of approximately 6,000, which is in itself significant. When the procession reached Bamba Square, the main square of the town centre, a decade of the rosary was said in Irish, reinforcing the narrative of Irishness and nationalism as intrinsically Catholic. The monument, inscribed in Irish only, like the Dennis Carey Memorial, states that it is dedicated to the people of North Tipperary from 1916 onwards who gave their lives for the Irish Republic. 31 names of men who died for the Irish Republic are listed, and this monument does not include the soldiers of the Irish Free State who died during the Civil War, only members of the anti-treaty, anti-government side who remained in the Irish Republican Army. The freestanding monument sits on a plinth in the town's, town's main thoroughfare. It's on the left-hand side of your screen there. It was originally accompanied by a sculpture of an Irish volunteer who became lo known locally as Jamesy. And you'll see him there on the right to commemorate the soldiers who sacrificed their lives. Jamesy remained in his distinguished position overseeing the business of the town for the duration of the period being examined, but he was later removed in 1955 after a number of objections about his ugly appearance. Um, there's actually an older photograph here which gives you a better idea of what it looked like at the time. Uh, the resolution just isn't very high, but that's how the monument would have looked uh, when it was originally unveiled. The monument's prominent position ensures that it's constantly in the public eye and consciousness. So on the day of the unveiling, an eminent IRA member and anti-treaty figure, Frank Ryan, was invited to address the crowd and officiate the unveiling of the monument. He asserted that the people of Nina have the right spirit in you, and you know that by raising a monument you've done a good thing. This is a quote from Frank Ryan. Uh, the whole the entire speech was said first in Irish and then repeated in English. However, in line with the message of the monument, Ryan went on to say, and again I quote, you have not done enough. There is one monument which you, in conjunction with the people of Ireland, must raise, the one and only fitting monument you can raise, an independent and undivided Irish Republic, which was met with applause. The choice of Ryan as the guest of honour conveys subtle differences between the unveiling of the Dennis Carey monument and the North Tipperary Republican one. Inviting Ryan to unveil the monument was in itself a political act and indicates that even amongst nationalist groups in Nina seeking to commemorate those who died for independence, who are commemorating the very same people because Dennis Carey is featured on, on the North Tipperary Republican monument, there were subtle differences in ideologies and group identities. The Republican monument was erected by the North Tipperary Sinn Féin executive with the permission of the Urban District Council, while the Cairn Memorial was organised by the Nina branch of the Gaelic League. This division seen here is mirrored both in Northern Ireland in this period between Republicans and Nationalists and in the pro-treaty and anti-treaty sides of the Irish Civil War. The monument was intended to be a constant reminder of past events and an inspiration for the young people of Tipperary. And again, I quote that they will have to finish the task which is yet unfinished. Ryan does not speak of tolerance or reconciliation in the same vein as Father O'Halloran, but he gives voice to a more radical republicanism, which was finding public expression during this period following the establishment and growth of the Fianna Fáil party, known as the Republican Party, which went on to secure electoral victory the following year in the 1932 general election. So, to conclude. Cecile Sachs Olson suggests that creations in urban space don't necessarily exist primarily to create communal agreement. These monuments or statues could be erected to reaffirm the supremacy of one community in a divided society and to belittle, intimidate or erase the identity of other communities present. The erection of these monuments in relatively quick succession in this period indicate this, with each community attempting to assert their dominance in the public sphere. This division in local society is reflected in the 1923 general election results for the area, which followed the Civil War, in which Tipperary returned three pro-treaty and three anti-treaty candidates, as well as a Labour candidate. There was no hegemony in the locality. 
the beaten foe that Father O'Halloran had referred to at the unveiling of the Kerry Memorial were not only those who had come to Ireland from overseas as part of the British Army during the War of Independence, but also those within their communities who called Ireland their home but maintained links with their British identity. Their sense of identity was increasingly rejected as invalid by the emerging Irish Free State. Perhaps the most revealing discourse in the analysis of all three monuments is the debate among the Nina Urban District Council on the application for public space to the Monument of the Great War. The acceptance of the desire to honour the dead conflicted with an increasing rejection in the Free State of the ceremonies associated with the erection of monuments to the war and the Union Jack flags, poppies and renditions of God Save the King that invariably accompanied it. What is notable about their action is how this decision was made by the Council who included both men who had lost family or served themselves in the British Army during the war as well as those who had lost family members at the hands of the British Army, the Irish Free State Army and the IRA in Ireland. For an example, uh, one councillor member, John Tierney, uh, he was a councillor on the Nina Urban District Council in this period. He himself had served in the British Army during the First World War and lost a younger brother, Michael, in action in March 1915, who was commemorated on the Nina War Memorial. His son, Martin, died in 1923 after complications from prolonged hunger strike while imprisoned in the Curra by Free State forces during the Irish Civil War and is commemorated on the North Tipperary Republican Monument. The British aspect to the identities of men who died in the First World War was no longer acceptable to the majority in the Irish Free State, even at the cost of neglecting the memory of their dead. The study of Nina is not an anomaly, but it reflects wider national concerns in this period and when compared to the other areas in my research of Limavady, Belfast and Dublin, it's serving to give us a greater understanding of how identity was expressed and perhaps even gives insight into how people felt about the complexities of their identities in this tumultuous period. The study of these monuments has proven that identity in this post-partition period was incredibly complicated and that the publics who erected them cannot be neatly categorised. Without the shackles of neat categorisation, Historians can work towards a better understanding of the past as it was for those who lived it and uncover a shared experience between societies on both sides of the Irish border. I hope to explore this more in my future research and incorporate other aspects of public history into my analysis, such as commemorative events and possibly even cultural initiatives. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, I look forward to discussing more with you in the thread um, and I really welcome any suggestions um, or questions that you might have. Thank you so much.